now let's talk about the next generation data warehouses. The new normal is a world of social distancing and contact tracing. Spatial data analysis is becoming more critical than ever for governments, for businesses, and even for our own very survival. We are lucky to have with us our next speaker who will take us through the examples of how big location data is helping respond to this crisis through effective location intelligence. He is Javier de la Torre, founder and chief strategy officer at Carto. Welcome, Javier. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. How are you? Lovely Very to nice see time. you. Lovely to see you, Javier. You are the first one, so uh, the level the level is uh, is uh, is already very high. I know Carto <laughs> when Carto was Carto de B, they, they were the the most successful ones at the beginning of many years ago. Now that you're super well known, so I'm sure you have a lot of fans in the audience, and I'm going to remember remind them that they can ask you questions at the end of your talk if you're going to talk around. Uh, 35 minutes more or less the last five minutes we can uh, dedicate to questions so make sure you uh, send your questions with enough time because Javier lately these past two days the, the audience is sending questions a bit too late when you're gone so before Javier leaves send your questions either in English or in Spanish his Spanish is as good as his English and uh, take advantage that he's with us so Javier when you are ready we're looking forward to listening to you all yours thank you very much Helen well it is uh, first of all, it is my pleasure to be here with you today, and I didn't realize that we were on the attic um, uh, floor. It's actually, I'm in the attic at home, so I think <laughs> it's quite convenient in that sense. Of course. So, and as Helen was saying, you, maybe you know, just as a little introduction, so I'm Javier de la Torre, and uh, yeah, I founded Carto with, with uh, many others, and I'm very happy to be here today talking about one part of analytics that uh, some of you might not know, and I think uh, you know it might be interesting on your day to day, but also understanding how it's um, being used as of today on responding to this crisis of COVID-19. So in fact, let me start with that. I know this sounds bold, but probably there's never been a more important time for geography. And I mentioned, you know, just because of two particular things that are happening. The most obvious, you know, is COVID-19, where, as you will see, location is a fundamental part for, you know, like managing this crisis. Not only, not only understanding how and where it is happening, but also um, kind of like, um, you know, like coordinating our response to it. And, and you will see a, a few examples of that on my talk. But also we cannot forget there's a number of other crises that are coming right now, you know, that still are going, things like climate change or biodiversity that are there and, you know, they haven't gone away and where understanding geography is also critical. So things, you know, like where, you know, where is the sea level is going to rise, which cities are more vulnerable to, to climate change is going to be very, very critical. So obviously, I mean, like we, um, I love geography. That's my career. But I think you know, like many people don't realize about the importance of, of it. And if we put it in the context of this conference, geography today is a study, is actually kind of like analyzed using what we call spatial data science. So think of spatial data science as a subset, right, of data science that is specialized on understanding geography. So, but before actually kind of like the best way that I like to describe uh, spatial data science is also by giving a few examples or, or you know like or like I'd like to say explaining the difference between understanding knowing where and knowing why let me actually call I dig a little bit on that so if you have in your let's say on your company you're selling a particular product and you have the locations of all your customers you likely can you know use a BI tool such as Tableau and make a map out of it and that will help you to understand where things are happening, right? You want to see where your customers are. But if you want to understand why your customers are there, you're going to need to create a model, that, you know, to, to model the characteristics of the places where your customers are so that you can understand why they're more you know, like likely to buy your products from one place versus another. So essentially, you have to create a model to understand the geography of your business. And for that, you're going to need a location intelligence platform. You're going to do a spatial analysis. And obviously, you know, you can use a platform like Cartoon, right? So that's the difference, right? So this very straight away there, you know, like one thing is being able to see where things happen, but that's not enough to understand why things are happening there. And how does this work? 
obviously, I mean, like, believe it or not, our our field was studied through uh, through the study of um, of uh, uh, of, um, of crisis going on in terms of you know like immunology and so on. Um, and you know, one great example, of course, you know, for explaining how our uh, type of analysis works is thinking on the spread of a virus. It's very obvious that the closer that you are to the virus, the more likelihood that you can get infected, right? So there's many things like that that can be a model and a study in the same way. So think of, you know, like customer behavior. If all your neighbors install an alarm, an alarm in their homes, the likelihood that you will install an alarm at your place increases dramatically, right? So this is what we call essentially uh, that, you know, in the, in the first law of geography, that everything is related to everything, but things that are close by tend to be more, re more uh, related, right? And that defines an entire field of analysis that we call spatial data science. Um, these techniques, uh, just to put it in context, you can think of them as another type of spatial modeling or machine learning, right? So you have, you know, like for vision, you will have like, uh, you know, you like driving, doing like self-driving cars, you have like vision type of uh, machine learning, you're doing like a speed, you have like natural language processing. Well, if you're working with location data, the spatial modeling and spatial data science is the field that kind of like does the spatial modeling, it is actually what you, what you will be using. Just a few pieces uh, technical here. If your data scientist asks you, why do we need to understand, you know, why do we have to take in consideration location? So the first thing, you know, just two of them, and there's many more, but, you know, two that are very obvious. Just think that if you model, you know, where your customers are, um, customers that are in near one to each other, like we're saying, are more similar than, than are those that are farther away. So it's not only the characteristics, it's also if they're cluster, if they're close one to another, because we influence one to another. We call that a spatially autocorrelation, right? The other thing that is important to understand is that, for example, customers behave differently based on their location, their regional variation. So we say, like, a model might work in a place, but it might work differently in a different place. We call this, the, those models are non-stationary. And if you don't model, and if you don't study your geography uh, taking in consideration location, you will be missing these things. So um, there's many organizations that haven't gone yet the way to to call like uh, to move to towards the spatial data science, but location is a fundamental uh, it's a fundamental dimension that most organizations are going to have to work with. At the end of the day, everything happens somewhere, so it's suitable, you know, for studying it from that perspective, right? Okay, so uh, so with that being said, um, obviously 2020 has given us an incredible crash course on location analytics. I think we all have never seen more maps and analysis about areas and zones in any other year more than in 2020, right? So we are all familiar with maps about, you know, like uh, which areas are more affected, you know, like which is, you know, the restrictions that you have in your areas. So there's been an incredible incredible amount of uh, data scientists working on a space of problems because of this and organizations are also working with location data. So in fact, only at Carto, we, we made the program to offer Carto for free to any um, COVID-19 type of uh, project. And we got 165 grants in a matter of a couple of months. So it's been really, really kind of like an explosion of analysis when it comes to uh, uh, COVID-19. I just want to show you a few examples of the things that you can do with uh, a spatial analysis on COVID-19. So think about, like, for example, calculating the risk of demographics uh, and health factors. So we know that COVID-19 doesn't affect everybody in the same way. So you know, like your age, your like your health, and many things define your vulnerability to the virus. So if you want to see then how it's actually how different how different communities are vulnerable to COVID you're going to actually need to start doing this type of modeling, right? So that's a very classical one. And that's used then later to kind of like provision where the resources government is going to put, you know, which areas are more likelihood or are in a bigger danger uh, because of the virus. Another one that we've seen, uh, unfortunately, also a lot on the news because it tends to be a very big, you know, like political debate, is this association between human mobility changes with, uh, um, uh, you know, with uh, with lockdowns and the socioeconomic patterns? So understanding does lockdown 
actually, you know, like changes, you know, like um, affects, you know, the uh, um, the infection rates and what is actually the patterns, in terms, what is actually the impact on the uh, um, on, on things, you know, like the economy around it. So, so that actually this year we've had the opportunity to do a lot of this analysis at the scale by by you know like looking at different strategies in different countries or different states in the United States where we could see you know how was the um, the different policies was actually getting um, you know like an impact on 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 the crisis on both the economy and on the health um, parameters. Even more kind of like. Uh, um, I would say, you know, like not mundane because very important, but you're like, particularly in Spain, uh, managing things, you know, in this new normality. How do you, how many people fit in a bit, right? That sounds very obvious, but you know, like you do actually need to do quite a bit of a space analysis to kind of perform this type of uh, um, analysis and, you know, and to, to, to open them, right? So this is just a, a few examples of that. The last one I'm going to say, like, <laughs> Saying like it, it just couldn't be more uh, more personal in a way. I'm in an attic. We are in the attic loads at home. I'm actually and I'm in a lockdown uh, area here in Spain. So in the case of Spain, uh, depending on on the region that you are, there's different kind of like um, um, lockdown strategies. And in the one that I, that I am is defined by a small region. So you can see it in here. It's in a town called Majada Onda in, in the north of uh, uh, Madrid, and and the way that you actually define those areas uh, has a very, a very big impact. Obviously, it has a very big impact on the people that live there. You know, you're like restricting, you know, what they can do and what they cannot do. But also, you know, like on the effectiveness of the measurements, right? Is this part of the city, you know, like people in this part of the of the city move more towards this other part of the city? Do they go somewhere else? So how do you split the territory? How do you split the regions? to maximize in a way, you know, or to limit the um, connections between uh, between um, citizens while um, minimizing the number of people that you have to lock down is a pretty heavy spatial problem. So those are the type of things that, you know, like uh, spatial data science enables you, right? Now with uh, COVID-19 and not only COVID-19, you know, like climate change and over the last five uh, to 10 years, um, it's fair to say that we've seen an incredible new set of requirements for space analysis. There is, uh, um, and, and I would like to call like a walk through a, a few of them, but it's only because, you know, like some advances on the cloud um, that we are actually right now able to do many of the studies that I was showing you. Um, and just so to set a little bit of the requirements, what, what are we seeing that has changed, right? What, what is right now that we are doing when we, when we work with this type of data? So the first thing, obviously, with COVID-19 that we've heard is the immediacy, right? The idea of like having data always uh, available, but you know, like be able to run analysis and get responses, results very, very quickly. It's very important. It's very important because you know we cannot wait, you know, like for for weeks, you know, to get the results in order to to um, to take uh, consideration. Like you might in the past, you know, like if you were a company looking at your um, where you're going to open a restaurant, you might you know take weeks to get that decisions. But in the case of you know like COVID nineteen, I mean, you're gonna need to act much faster than that. The other thing that we we see um, is the is the freshness of the data. So um, now, I mean, data is, uh, the world is changing very fast, as we know. I mean, with crisis like COVID-19, now we see, you know, that suddenly um, we have a, um, we need to look at the population and, you know, and demographics in a very immediate way, in a very fresh way. And, and things, you know, where, you know, like how you had characterized population in a place has changed very, very quickly. So, um so we need the data to be more fresh than ever. In fact, we used to call our work in orbital thinking on, you know, like data being uh, updated once a year was the most common call like time frame for uh, for the upgrades, updates on the uh, on the data on, on location data. And now we're looking at data sets that gets updated, you know, like weekly, um, monthly, even weekly, and sometimes daily or even hourly. So the data is becoming much at, at a much faster refresh rate than before. Um, it also has to be multi-source because of the need to kind of get things done very fast and we need to actually get them, you know, like with very fresh data, no single source of data, it's becoming enough to explain 
most of the things that we need to model. So for example, census data um, gets done in most countries every 10 years. It gets updated every year with samples. Well, that's not going to make it for some of the analysis. So, um, so therefore, you need to start looking at, you know, like mobile phones data, street credit card transactions data. You're going to need to have many different alternative sources of data that you need to compare and you need to use to complete the picture of your analysis. Um, also continues. Um, now we see that most analysis, you know, become effective when you are like, in a kind of like in continuous integration mode where you don't come and do it once. You come, prepare the analysis and let it go for time, right? So we see right now in COVID-19, it's very clear, you know, with the seven days, color kind of like windows for some of the KPIs, some of the metrics that they use, but also, you know, it's the tendency. It's, it's the importance is not in seeing a once time snapshot, but to see how it is evolving, right? So you need to kind of like have your models always be running continuously. And finally, you need to automate it for all the previous uh, reasons. I mean, like if the if your analysis cannot be done in an automated way, you're likely not going to meet um, you know the immediacy, the freshness, and the continuous uh, requirements, right? So that's actually pretty heavy new set of requirements that we didn't have before. But luckily, one of the things that you know that have happened. Um, not only to uh, spatial data science, but overall to analysis, it's been the cloud, as we have seen in this conference a lot, and you are all aware. So um, in our world, we say that, you know, like cloud native space analysis, and I'd like to call like dig a little bit on to what that means, cloud native space analysis, is actually the solution, you know, to a lot of these uh, new requirements. If it wouldn't be for the cloud, it will always be impossible, will be cost prohibitively, it will only be accessible to very few organizations to do the type of analysis that we've done, that we are doing these days. So again, like with many other things, uh, you know, like we said, like what would have been, you know, like COVID-19 if we didn't have Netflix? Well, we don't know what it would have been, you know, like COVID-19 if we didn't have cloud for doing some of this spatial analysis. So let me tell you a little bit about what this uh, space analysis uh, actually, uh, uh, cloud native space analysis means. So it's, it's pretty much based on what we like to call the next generation data warehouses. And uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, I'm sure you know most of you are, but these are uh, the, uh, data warehouses such as Google BigQuery, Snowflake, Athena, Delta Lake, um, Apache Drill from an open source perspective. Um, so those are kind of like a set of data warehouses, as you will see, they have some specific uh, um, kind of like design principles that works very well for the type of analysis that we're doing. Um, some of them have the common, particular BigQuery, Snowflake, and Athena, um, sorry, uh, BigQuery, Athena, and Azure Synaptics, you will see uh, that they're in the, the same category because they, they cost actually the same cost for the same, they have the same price on their different clouds. So it's $5 for process terabyte. It's becoming kind of like a standard in that. And all of these data warehouses are in a way adapting spatial capabilities to it. The first one was really BigQuery in July 2018, but since then Snowflake in February 2020 and Amazon Redshift in November 2019 have already added um, spatial capabilities to the products like, you know, like a spatial um, data types and, and, and functions. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty great for us. Right. And why is this very interesting? What, what is the special about these type of products? So the first one that you, uh, I'm sure many of you are very aware is this computing the storage separation, because you pay separately, you know, like the storage, you know, which is normally on S3, Google cloud storage in, in cheap storage, cloud storage, um, separately from when you actually do the analysis, it becomes very effective for essentially kind of collecting a ton of data, but only pay for the analysis that you're going to make with it. In fact, if it wouldn't be for this computing storage separation, the bills of you know, like running some of this analysis will be profitable. So it will be so expensive that it wouldn't be possible. So that's a, 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 key, uh, a key component. The second is the scalability. Um, as this uh, um, data warehouse leverages the cloud computing, uh, they can essentially open up uh, many instances and run on the processing in parallel, right? And that enables us you know, to do things like, in this case, in this map, what you're looking at is around 14 billion points in a map. 
Now, in order to visualize something like 14 billion points in a map or do an analysis on that, you're going to need to partition and you're going to need to process the data in a very, very effective way. So actually in Carto, we created a full technology um, for that. So if you if you um, if you're familiar with formats like Parquet or you know like or, or Apache Arrow, um, there's another way of structuring the data that is more optimized towards location. And it's kind of like in what we call in tiles in a pyramid. Um, so that makes it very effective not only for visualizing data but also for processing uh, and for doing analysis on that data. And that type of formats, that type of indexes, you know, like run incredibly well on this type of data warehouses. Um, and last, the, the third one is what we call data multi-tenancy. The fact that, you know, like most of these sources, because they live on the cloud, you know, like the separation between the users, since it's a logical separation. So all the data is under the same place in the cloud, right? So I like to say we all live in a single database. So that makes effective things like this, where you have like a SQL, where you are essentially doing the joins between data sets provided by many different providers. Uh, by by many different uh, um, sources, you know that they create on their own, but that you can join live inside your uh, inside your uh, queries, which is an amazing thing. No need for ETL, no need you know like uh, for replicating the data, all that extra cost. That's incredible. In fact, actually, Carto does um, does benefit a lot from that. We do as part of our product have a product called Data Observatory that essentially enables uh, provides. Um, uh, a very comprehensive list of data sets to use for space analysis. Things like demographics, human mobility, all sort of like the most common data that you need to do a spatial analysis, we already provide it. Um, we have more than 10 categories in 33 data sources. All of this right now is available in BigQuery and coming to Snowflake and uh, Athena and Azure Synaptics in the coming months, right? That means that we have all the data already prepared so that you don't have to import it into your system. It's already, like I like to say, it's a join ahead of, of you, right? It's a, it's a game changer on the way that we distribute data. At the end of the day, I mean, like what we actually do at Carto with all of this is we like is to say accelerate the space analytics. By leveraging this next generation data warehouse with its own characteristics and adding a spatial layer on top of it, our goal is that more organizations can like, discover the power of spatial analytics for their own business. And with that, I mean, like, it's very clear. I mean, like, spatial analytics is going cloud native. That's just really not going anywhere, anywhere else. So if you're, very, if you're interested around it or if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer all of that. But for that, I'll just, you know, like to call I leave it, uh, leave it there. Um, if you are not looking at the location component, there's likely something that you are missing in there. I'll be happy to actually help you look at it. So thank you very much. If there's any questions, I don't know. I'm just now looking at how. Okay, I have to. I guess I, I have to. I, I wasn't yep. ready. I wasn't ready, Javier. You have so much more time. <laughs> <laughs> you were supposed to finish like in 15 minutes. So uh, oh. I don't know if the questions are coming in yet or not. Actually, uh, so Javier, I don't know if you could uh, go more in depth into some of the cases, for example, sure, sure. Uh, of your, you know, the success, some of the latest uh, cases that you were, you actually published in your blog in Carto, in the, in the website, you have some, uh, you know, examples yeah, yeah. Of, uh, of clients, of the, the use of this, uh, um, with clients, uh, actual uh, case study, no case studies, but Casi yeah, yeah. ejemplos, ejemplos prácticos, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. with, uh, with your clients. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, uh, this is great, I mean, I tend to speak very fast, so I'm sure that's what's happening here, so. <laughs> no problem, that is fantastic, hey, usually we have the this other This is the problem. first time, I mean, like, so we So we have another, kind of another 10 minutes, if you want, Javier, if you want, and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, for the. Know, for happy, happy, actually, you know, like, one of the things I love to actually share with you is, is some of these visualizations I was talking about. Sure. Like, if you're interested in, um, on, you know, like, on, on visualizing or handling, like, hundreds of millions or billions of rows, you know, like, an, on the map, if you have that type of data, we'd love mm -hmm. to actually uh, work with you guys. So, um, I'm just actually going to give you a demo. I think that's probably, uh, that's probably the, the best thing here. Um, and, and tell us a bit more a about, uh, Javier, and tell us a bit more about, uh, I think it was very interesting what you said about the, um, 
um, but you only pay for the data that you uh, analyze. Uh, how does uh, talk, tell us about costs in general, or mm -hmm. how how uh, how is is this easy for any company? Because your, your clients are obviously we were talking before Mastercard, super top big companies. But is this supposed to be used by any small company, any retailer? Uh, you said that you you said uh, something like everybody's going to be needing. I've been taking notes. Everybody's going to mm -hmm. be uh, having to use this uh, because location is is everywhere. Everything we are always everything is somewhere. So in yeah. which in which sense this is uh, available? You said uh, the computing storage separation allows people you know the access to many uh, clients, but uh, to how many? I mean, any old retailer mm -hmm. from the street. Uh, mm -hmm. You're talking all yeah. the most huge companies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so maybe that's yeah. That, that, let's let's dig in that. So in terms of you know like the cost. So um, if you're if you haven't checked out you know like products like say like BigQuery or you know like or Athena or uh, Synapse Analytics, you'll see this is an example on on, on BigQuery. And like the the difference on the way that it works is that you used to pay for the amount of data that you store on your database on your data warehouse. Mm -hmm. Now you do pay for that. You pay for the storage, but at the same time, you do pay for you. You do pay separately for when you actually do queries to it, and that means that in the case of uh, of uh, BigQuery, I was just going to show you um, an example uh, query that I'm, I'm doing here. Um, you know, like I might have a data set. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to show you an example data set in here. Um, so, for example, um, a public data. So in this uh, this database, I'm going to find. Time, we're okay with, oh, yeah, we're no okay with time for the time being. <laughs> I'm going to show you here, like for example, here there's many tables, there's many uh, data sources already available. I wanted to show you one uh, that is uh, called OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap is a database of like the Wikipedia of maps, and you have here, for example, the entire. You can, you can find here almost any, let's say, bar retailer in the world. Right, mm -hmm. just by by looking at at uh, this data, right. And if I look at you know like this data, this database, if I look at the at the details and so on, this is a this is for example a table that it has around 870 million records. It's in size is around 300 gigabytes. If you needed to have this table available for query in a regular database. Um, you will need to have a very, very large uh, uh, machine available for, for computing, right? You want mm -hmm. to run this in a Postgres and so on. So that, that makes it, you know, will make it really expensive. Because you will have to have a very large uh, uh, server just for be able to, to, to query this, uh, this table. Now, the difference on this type of uh, data warehouse, the way that they work, is that when I... I'm going to do here, I'm going to query this table. Are we supposed right. to be seeing your screen, uh, Javier? Because uh, we, we are not seeing. Are you, are you sharing? Oh, ah, sorry, yeah, I'm not sorry. seeing it, but yes. I'm I am the one who's that. not seeing, apparently. <laughs> Everybody else does. And actually, okay, I have a couple okay, of great. questions already for you, Javier. So okay, when you're great. ready, well, yeah, go let ahead. Me, let, me just, let me just finish this, right? So, uh, so when, I, when, I, when I do, uh, when I run this, you know, like now, this is actually not a very, a very good query. So actually now, uh, in this case, BigQuery is only going to charge me for the amount of, in this case, gigabytes or terabytes of data that it needed to process the query. So it means that, you know, I always had this table, I almost paid nothing for it, but when I did the query, I paid a little for it, right? And that changes dramatically, like I said, like the, the way that, you know, like you, essentially now everybody can have a data lake without actually paying for it. Okay. This is almost free, the storage. And you only pay for when you actually use it. So you only really pay at the time where you're getting the value out of it. And that's been a key, uh, big key in here. And that is, to your point, means that now organizations with much smaller you know, capacity have now access to do analysis that before just wasn't possible. I mean, Excellent. processing like this uh, 140 billion, uh, 14 billion data set will require an amount of infrastructure for any uh, uh, organization that was only available for a few of them. Now okay. that's actually you know like accessible to anybody, and uh, okay. in terms of that, and you can see you know from organizations that you know we work with that you know work at um, you know, like they, they might only have like five locations you know like it's very small organizations to to like I said like to we're talking Mastercard, Vodafone, very very large uh, um, organizations. So there's a huge democratization on the capabilities. 
Excellent. This is very good news for Carto and for the world in general. Right. <laughs> uh, um, Javier, they ask you, uh, Asuncion is asking you, uh, she says, hi, what are the opportunities for spatial data in digital market marketing use cases? Yep. Well, that definitely, you know, like it's, uh, um, I mean, like in the case of marketing, there's been obviously a, a, a very big uh, uh, interest around all the, um, Ad tech. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen here, so I can see you. Too. Um, so one one area that you know, like with uh, 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 we've seen obviously with the uh, uh, targeting, right? So so understanding audiences based on location is being pretty critical, right? So not only it's not the same. I mean, not only the country, but you know, understanding the population, so the possibilities to target individually, you know, like based on you know where you are and you know, and the characteristics is being one of the most successful usage of location intelligence traditionally. Now that's actually changing quite a lot these days, you know, because of privacy and for good reasons. So um, there's not, you know, so much of, you know, like uh, targeting now the with location since, you know, like most of the data uh, these days is, is very well locked down in, in that sense. So the law of opportunities are moving towards, you know, like connecting the physical space with the online experience. Like for example, can you actually connect you know, like your visitors that come into your store in your shopping mall, you know, with what is actually their behavior online. Those are actually the things that, you know, like location also is pretty important, understanding your your customers and, you know, like and providing better experiences. And, and those are some of the frontiers, I would say, that we've seen on the marketing side. Excellent. So, Asuncion, take note of those uh, tips. Uh, Lourdes is asking you, what about the future on this or of this? Do you have already real references and achievements? <laughs> well, well, I mean, I, I mean like, you do have a few. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, I mean, I mean, like, if you talk about like the industry in itself, I mean, like, it's, uh, the uh, location industry and um, it's, it's been existing for 40 years. Now, I mean, on, on our journey, I mean, like, our company started a few years back. Uh, we have mo now more than a thousand uh, customers, you know, from all over the world. I think last time we counted, it was like, 45 different countries around the world. So the, the need for understanding location is uh, it's, uh, it's fundamental. Now, um, how fast are organizations realizing of the importance of this domain? This is still, you know, like varies from industry to industry, but, uh, you know, from obviously the public sector and governments is already been there, I mean, like uh, for a long time. Um, but now we've seen a lot on, you know, like on insurance, on, you know, like on retail, on telcos. Um, if your organization is not taking consideration location, uh, it will eventually. Yeah, and and uh, I've read that apparently there is a, obviously an exponential growth uh, forecast for 2026-27. I don't know which why those dates particularly, yeah. and I guess this year 2020 has as a, as a, uh, well, uh, if you want ad, uh, advance or uh, press the. the throttle into, into into that growth which was already there right yeah i mean on, on one part for sure i mean like there's been an incredible acceleration of digital transformation as we all know and as many organizations you know have done that transformation location intelligence is one part of that yeah. of that path so so you you definitely have in that i mean like the projections from a business perspective i think is on the order of like 70 billion dollars industry you know like in the next four years so it's it's a very large uh, uh industry and it Again, it varies a lot, you know, from uh, uh, from sector to sector. Um, one way that I like to describe it is that um, most studies say that you know around eighty percent of data has a location component. Um, and if you think about it that way, uh, you know, like that's an incredible amount of data that yet have not been used from a, a, a spatial. Uh, perspective. So the the growth in terms of you know like how much uh, uh, how many organizations will be enabled, it's very very substantial. I think it's a double digit growth you know year over year, uh, and it's been you know for a number of years now. So there's a bright future ahead then for for us and for Carto as well. Uh, he was telling me before Javier the amount of work they have. This is fantastic news for a, a Spanish company that is. He's based in a, in a way in, in the States as well. Uh, Javier is, is usually in New York. Now he's enjoying yeah. Mahalaonda, which is fantastic. The attic day, <laughs> Mahalaonda. Uh, 
we have no time for more, Javier, but uh, as, as you uh, say in your website, uh, your slogan or your motto is moving from seeing where to understanding why. So unlock the power of spatial analysis. That was fantastic having Javier de la Torre to uh, open this third day, third day at Big Things Conference. Thank you so much. It was lovely having you, Javier. I hope to see you around and to see you soon in Big Things next year. Okay? Thank you very much, Helen. Big kiss yeah. to you. Big, big kiss to you and to all the Carto team.